Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning. I found out early this morning that I have the privilege of introducing the individual who will be um, presenting our message this morning. And perhaps Mark and I should have collaborated a little bit because it's definitely been a year of reflection for this individual. Um, after 20 years of law practice, um, 13 years um, behind the bench in McLean County as an associate judge, um, my dad is retired. And um, Retirement's not a time for rest for him. He decided a few years ago he'd go back to school. And um, I guess the educator is in my heart. I get it naturally. But um, he went back to Lincoln Christian University, worked on his MDiv, correct? Yep. And, um, and he was recently ordained in November. Um, again, we celebrated his retirement from, from um, his full-time career this month, earlier this month. Um, my dad through the years has been an example of integrity and humility and compassion, and so it's my privilege to introduce him this morning, David Butler. Good morning. I hate to mess up such a good introduction by speaking. Maybe I should just quit. Um, I was looking around for a clock, and I, I told Sean I needed a clock because I want to make sure that the sermon didn't go more than two hours. <laughs> he said, well, I better show you where the light switches are because if your sermon goes two hours, you'll be the last one here when it's over. Uh, I also asked him if, if I should wear a tie, and Sean said, what's that? <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, we're pretty informal here, so that's, that's good. I do want to thank you for allowing me to share God's word with you today. I, I want you to know that if I only had two minutes to speak to you today, your sermon meditation would have been it. I really appreciated uh, your meditator today in talking about how God works in the best of times and in the worst of times of our life. So uh, I deeply appreciated his meditation. <clears throat> My message this morning is called, In Times Like These. I hope it will be a message of joy and peace for you. I have good news and I have bad news. I don't know about you, but I hate it when somebody says that to me. I'd rather they just said I have good news. But when they say that to me, my response is always the same. Okay, give me the bad news first. Unfortunately, there's no shortage of bad news. Every time we turn on the news or read a newspaper, it seems like the world is in chaos. We read and hear and see about wildfires destroying hundreds of homes, threats of aggression by nuclear powers, floods, mass shootings, and political unrest. Then there are our own individual trials, death of a loved one, loss of a job, breakup of a relationship, serious health concerns, and other trials. Are you feeling the peace and joy yet? Well. Me neither, and I wrote this. There's good news coming. I didn't come here to depress you, uh, but to share with you scriptures of hope and encouragement for these troubled times and those to come. Paul Harvey said, in times like these, it's good to remember that there have always been times like these. And he was right. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, said, the days are evil. And that was 2,000 years ago. Both the Old Testament and the New tell of wars and famines and natural disasters and people hurting each other. We face the same kind of hardships people faced in Abraham's day when Jesus walked the earth and for the 2,000 years since then. They had the same fears and anxieties that we experience today. There are times in our lives when it feels like the wheels have come off and things are spinning out of control. We may be suffering because our body is failing or we are lonesome, depressed, angry, afraid, or confused about something that has happened to us. But this is not new. There have always been fires and hurricanes and floods and wars and crime and disease. And people who are unfaithful, dishonest, and hurtful. Sometimes we are hurt by someone else's sin, and there may be times when we hurt others by our sin. 
And this also is nothing new. We are not sin's first generation. People have sinned before us and will sin after us until Jesus comes again. But through all of that, there is good news. In times like these, we should also remember that throughout all of the suffering of humans, whatever the cause, God has been there with them, and he is with us too. When things appear to be coming apart at the seams, God is there. As the Apostle Paul told the Colossians, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There are times when we don't understand why something has happened. Paul told the Ephesians that God works in everything in accordance with his purposes. In John 5, Jesus tells us, My Father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. It's for us to believe that God is at work in our lives for his good purposes. This is God's world, his universe, He is in charge of his creation and always will be. In him, all things hold together. His world will not come apart, it seems. In Psalm 50, God said, Call on me in the day of trouble. Peter wrote, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. God knows what we're going through, and he listens to our cries. In the Old Testament, David suffered vicious attacks from enemies he had not provoked. In his despair, he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my words of groaning. Jesus also suffered many things that he did not deserve. As he hung on the cross, he made the same cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even before he was crucified, Jesus felt the same pains that we do. He was beaten, rejected, mocked, called names, ignored, insulted. He knew poverty and hunger, temptation, grief, injustice, and betrayal. But neither David nor Jesus was forsaken by God, who worked in their lives for his purposes. And though they both despaired, they sought God's will in their suffering. While hanging on the cross, Jesus said, Not my will be done, but yours. And in another psalm, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And even though it may feel like it, God does not forsake us when we suffer. In John's Gospel, Jesus tells us, Do not let your heart be troubled. He's telling us, I know you are suffering, and I will bring you through this. God spoke to Israel and to us, saying, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen and help you, strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Here's what I want you to do. When you're in trouble, Read this scripture and hear God speaking just to you, and you will feel the comfort of God's words. When suffering and tragedy comes, I know it may be hard for us to let these words ease our pain or calm our anxiety. My message for you today is trust God's word. Believe that he will get you through whatever is troubling you. Call on him and wait for him to come. Then trust his answer to your prayers and his purpose in your suffering. As David wrote in Psalm 37, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, wrote that God is never in a hurry, but he's always on time. Sometimes we're more like the person who prayed, God, give me patience, Now, when I showed my wife these notes about waiting patiently, she said, unless you've given birth, you really don't know what it means to wait patiently. And I can't argue with that. 
wouldn't if I could. When I showed these notes to Sean Lindsay, he said, unless you're a Cub fan, you really don't know what it means to wait patiently. And they could be right. Expectant mothers typically have to wait about nine months. Cub fans typically have to wait about a century. Remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Now, this story is told in about 100 verses, and I won't, I won't tell you the story in 100 verses, but some of the details are important for, in order for us to understand how God can work and does work in the suffering in our lives. Joseph was one of 12 sons born to Jacob and Rachel. So he had 11 brothers, and, but Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons, so his brothers hated him for that. When as a teenager, Joseph had a dream that he and his brothers were out binding sheaves of grain, and his dream was that his sheaf stood upright and their sheaves bowed down to his. Well, when he told his brothers about this dream, they hated him all the more. The response was, you're going to rule us? If that wasn't bad enough, Joseph had another dream that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars had bowed down to him. And when he told his brothers about this dream, that was all they could take. But while his brothers were out uh, grazing his father's sheep, Jacob sent Joseph to check up on him. And as he's coming, they see him coming, and they plot to kill him. But one of the brothers didn't want to kill him. So when Joseph got there, they threw him in a well instead. It was a dry well, and they threw him in the well. Now, Joseph had some tough siblings. And I, I had three older sisters and an older brother, and as obnoxious as I was as a teenager, not once did they throw me down a well. But Joseph's brothers didn't mess around. They'd had enough, so down the well he went. While they were still there, and you talk about, while they were still there, a caravan came by, headed for Egypt. And so they pulled him out of the well, and they sold him to the caravan. Now, you talk about a good news, bad news. The good news is, we're going to take you out of this well. The bad news is, we're going to sell you to a caravan. So they traded him in like a like deposit on a pop bottle, and off to Egypt went Joseph. When he got to Egypt, Joseph was sold into slavery, as you know, to Potiphar. But Joseph was a faithful servant and soon became the head of Potiphar's household. And Joseph was a handsome young man, and unfortunately, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. And when he refused, Joseph was an honorable man. When he refused, she told Potiphar that Joseph had tried to seduce her. And in his anger, Potiphar threw Joseph in prison. And there's a story, and in, in, while he was in prison, he, was, he interpreted accurately some inmates' dreams. And what he predicted and what he described in their dreams came true. So when, when the pharaoh of Egypt had a very troubling dream, he was told that Joseph could interpret that dream. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and told Joseph the dream. And Joseph told Pharaoh that what his dream meant was that Egypt would experience seven good years of harvest, followed by seven years of famine. So Pharaoh appointed Joseph in charge of all of his land to raise food and store it up for the coming famine. And when the famine did come, it also hit Canaan, where Joseph's father and brothers lived. Because of that, uh, Jacob sent 10 of Joseph's brothers to Egypt to buy food. And when the brothers got to Egypt, they were brought before Joseph because he was in charge of the food. And they didn't recognize Joseph, so they bowed down to him as... Uh, Pharaoh's governor. And you can almost hear Joseph saying, I told you guys you were going to bow down to me. But he didn't. He didn't say a thing. He didn't reveal himself to them. But what he did was he accused them of being spies in order to test them. And he, he put one of his own brothers in jail and sent the rest back to Canaan. He told them, go home and get your other brother that you didn't bring with you. And he sent him home with food. But when the brothers returned to Egypt, with their other brother, and to get more food, and, and the brother they left behind, Joseph had them brought to his house, and he fed them well, and then he revealed himself to them. And of course, they were terrified, They're probably looking at each other, thinking, you think he remembers that we threw him down a well and sold him into slavery? But Joseph remembered, but he forgave them, and he told them, do not be afraid. What he said to them, he told his brothers that God had sent him to Egypt, so that he could save them and others from the famine. 
He said, you meant me evil, but God meant it for good to save many lives. This is a wonderful story of trust and patience and seeing God's purpose in our hardships. Joseph was patient in affliction, and he did trust God's purpose in his hardships. And that's what we should do. Know that God is working in whatever happens to us. Remember, Jesus said God is always working. Only God can see the big picture of his plan, which will work out perfectly in the end. God's loving, in God's loving hands, no suffering we face is ever without purpose, no matter how it seems at the moment. Even Jesus' followers, who were devastated as they watched him being crucified, did not understand God's purpose at the time. I want you to think of some of the worst things that have ever happened to you and ask yourself, do I trust God to use those things to further his good and perfect plan? It's a tough question. Those times when we seem to have no compass to guide us and no rudder to steer us should, should be a reminder to us to give control of our lives to God. When trouble comes, we should have the same confidence in the Lord as David, who said, when I'm afraid, I will trust you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. This is from Psalms 56. This is David the king who cried, my God, why have you forsaken me? That regained the trust in God he had as David the boy who stood face to face with the Philistine giant, Goliath. Pray in times of trouble, then have faith that help is on the way. Sometimes we have to wait in pain and tears. But God's heart is tender, and he understands our struggle to wait and endure. He is always beside us with exactly what we need to keep going. We must also trust the help that he does send. Instead of healing, he may send comfort. Instead of safety, he may send courage. Instead of mending a failing relationship, he may lead us to a new one. Instead of preventing disaster, he may help us to grow strong through it. Waiting and hoping and trusting are wound together like strands in a rope. Max Licato wrote a book about going through hard times called You'll Get Through This. It's a wonderful book. I, re I recommend it highly. This is what Max Licato said about waiting for and trusting God. He said, what is coming will make sense of what is happening now. Let God finish his work. Let the composer finish his symphony. The forecast is simple. Good days, bad days, but God is in all days. He is the Lord of the famine and the feast, and he uses both to accomplish his will. When her daughter Jennifer was about two years old, I played a game with her. I had her stand on the landing on the stairway, which is about three steps up. I told her, turn her back to me. Now fall backwards. And she looked at me like, are you sure about this? Even at two, <clears throat> she was wondering whether this was going to work out OK. I assured her, dad will catch you. And so. The first time, reluctantly, she did. She looked a little bit like an airplane doing the backstroke. <laughs> but of course, I caught her. And when I caught her, then she trusted me. She laughed and she giggled and she wanted to do it again. She learned immediately that she could trust me. But sometimes we have to trust God for a long time to answer our prayers or to relieve our suffering. He works in our lives in his time. I built trust with Jennifer that has lasted since then. It's like when we're waiting for medical test results. I love that. Don't you? Our doctors tell us that there's something that concerns them, and so they order some tests. In a few days, when the tests come back okay, we praise God and we thank God as we should. This should also cause us to trust God if we have to wait wait much longer for good news or when the test results are not good. Good days, bad days. God is in all days. Trust the one who loves us. 
All things of this world will pass, both good and evil. This is not a proclamation of doom. This is what we look forward to. This is the Advent season. Advent refers to waiting expectantly for something. Believers waited expectantly for for the coming of Christ the Messiah and wait expectantly now for his return. When Jesus does return, it will be to take us home with him to the place he has prepared for us. On Christmas Day, we celebrate his birth with great joy. On Easter, we remember what he suffered for us and why he suffered for us. The wonder is that not only does he know our suffering, he also suffered for us in our stead. And as strange as it may sound, that's the good news gospel, that because of Jesus' suffering, we have an eternity of peace and joy waiting for us with God, who loves us so much. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John describes what awaits us in heaven. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain. One of my favorite songs is a Chris Tomlin song called, I Will Rise. One of the lines in the song is, I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. And while we're waiting for that day to come, we may also have to wait expectantly for help or blessings that we've prayed for. Our God is the God of hope. So what do we have here and now to give us hope? We have his word to guide and encourage us. As the psalmist said, your word is a light unto my feet. God himself said, do not be afraid. We have his promises to us. Peter wrote, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, home of the righteous. The writer of Hebrews said, he who promises is faithful. We have our faith in him. Psalm 33 says, for our heart is glad in him because we trust his holy name. We have each other. Friend loves at all times, and a brother is made for adversity. You recognize that as Psalm 17. And we have his faithfulness to us. Maybe one of the most comforting verses of all is Psalm 91.4. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You know, we also can be comforters for those who are hurting. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we may comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received. Paul's telling us to pay God's comfort forward to someone who needs it. This message is often repeated by Christian writers. I read a lot of books. I have a lot of books. The bookshelves in my den are full. There are piles of books on the floor. The top of my desk is stacked with books. My wife says it looks like a library threw up in my den. But if I could only have two books, they would be my NIV study Bible. As you can see, I use the duct tape edition. The other is Oswald Chambers' my utmost or his highest. This book is my traveling companion. Whenever I go anywhere overnight, this book goes with me. Wonderful book. Oswald Chambers says this about helping others benefit from our hard times. He said, when you are in the dark, listen, and God will give you a very precious message for someone else when you get into the light. If we let him, God will bring guidance and comfort to someone else through the trials we have had or are going through now. When we comfort others while we ourselves are suffering, we change the focus from our pain to God's love for us and for others. Christmas time is a time of great joy, but it's also a time of grief for those who have lost a loved one. We seem to miss the ones that we've lost the most at Christmas time. 
we can be comforters by sharing God's words of joy and hope to others. If you know someone who is sad or lonesome or hurting this week, send them a card or a text or an email. Let them know that you're thinking about them and praying for them and share a scripture of comfort with them. Better yet, tell them in person if you can. This will let God comfort and love someone through you. I started this morning when I told you that I didn't come here to depress you. I also have not tried to bring you a message that would cause you to leave here giddy and laughing and giving each other high fives, but to help you have a sense of peace and comfort that comes from trusting God and knowing he is in control even when things seem to be in chaos. That's what makes the joy of the Christmas season lasting throughout the year and throughout our lives. God's plan has a happy ending that never ends. He is good, he loves us, and he has great things in store for us that are so wonderful that we can't describe them. He gives us hope and peace and joy and love through Jesus. In times like these, as a sermon title, it sounds unfinished. If you were counting, I used the word trust 16 times this morning. So I think I may have found the rest of the name of this sermon. In times like these, trust in the Lord. I'll leave you this morning with the words that Paul spoke to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you so much. and We know that you love us so much, more than we can describe. Lord, teach us to trust you during hard times, knowing that you are there beside us, hurting as we hurt, and loving us through it. Lord, give us the faith to know that Whatever is happening in our lives, both joyous things and hard things, that you are at work through your perfect plan. These things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.